We already know how to perform a titration and hopefully you understand how a titration works as a type of analysis in order to find an unknown concentration. But it turns out it's also useful sometimes to graph the pH of a solution as it's being titrated. And one of the things that such graphs could be used for is to choose appropriate indicators for a certain titration. And so that's what we're going to look at on this video. How do we how do we graph an acid-base titration curve? What does it mean? And how do we choose indicators from it? So when we actually performed a titration, we had one unknown solution. But when we're doing the graphs, we're going to know the concentration of both of our solutions precisely and watch what happens to the pH as we go through the titration. So here's the setup. Um, you have a titration set up like normal with your burette and your sample and your Erlenmeyer flask. But now instead of adding indicator uh, to try to reach an endpoint, we are going to insert a pH meter into our sample. And then we're going to take an initial pH reading. We're going to add, say, one milliliter of titrant, stop it, take another pH reading and keep going. So every milliliter of titrant that we add, we're going to take another pH reading. And then also we're not going to stop at the end point. We are going to just keep going. We're not even going to aim for any sort of equivalence point. We're just going to keep going until we've used tons of excess titrant. And then we'll take our readings and we will plot them on a graph. So here's an example setup of a graph and I've given it a title for this scenario. So this is going to be a titration of 10 milliliters of 0.1 mole per liter HBr with 0.1 mole per liter KOH. So if we carefully look through that title, we can actually get a lot of information about the titration that's going on. So we know that the stuff we're titrating, as it's written, is 10 mils of 0.1 mole per liter HBr. That means that the hydrobromic acid is in our sample because that's the way titrations are always designated. You're titrating the sample with the titrant. And we know this HBr has 0.1 moles per liter and we know we have 10 mil samples of it. And then we're titrating that with 0.1 mole per liter KOH. So that means as our titrant we have potassium hydroxide. So let's just look at the equation that's going on or the reaction that's happening down here in our flask there's going to be some hydrobromic acid in our flask and we will be adding potassium hydroxide and so the acid and the base are going to neutralize and we'll have some potassium bromide left in the solution and this is balanced already I just want to point out for any acid base titration we can actually narrow this down into the net ionic equation so if you'd find the net ionic equation here, you would find that the potassium ions and the bromide ions don't change throughout the whole reaction, so they're actually spectator ions. And so really what we're looking at is the acid part, the hydronium, is reacting with the hydroxide to form liquid water. And to balance it like this, we need a 2 there. And this is really what's happening for any acid-base titration. Okay, so we know we're starting with 10.0 mils of our acid. We know that both of them are 0 0.100 moles per liter. And the volume of our base is actually what we are going to be adding a little bit, measuring the pH, adding a little bit more, measuring the pH. So just imagine for starters, we've got our 10 mils of HBr in our sample. We have a burette full of potassium hydroxide. Before we let any titrant into our sample, the pH we would expect to be very low because HBr is a strong acid. So let's say, imagine that we're around one, a pH of one originally in our sample. So let me finish up my axis titles here. We're going to be measuring the pH against the volume of titrant that we add. So let's say we add one milliliter of titrant and we measure the pH. The pH, well, what actually happened? We've added a little bit of base to our acid, so we would expect the pH to have gone up slightly. 
and that trend will continue for a bit. Every time we add a milliliter, the pH will go up slightly because we're adding some base. The base reacts with the acid, and our solution is not as acidic anymore. As we keep doing that, we'll notice that the pH eventually kind of shoots up. It, 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 the graph turns a lot steeper until we get something like this. And I'll explain why it's so steep in a minute. But when we reach uh, the neutral point, I can tell you for this scenario that that is going to happen at a pH of 7 and when we've added 10 mils. And the reason I know that is because both of our, our acid and our base have the same concentration and they react in a 1 to 1 mole ratio. So therefore the equivalence point or the point at which they're both going to be totally used up will be when we have exactly 10 mils of our base and 10 mils of our acid so that there's the same number of molecules of each and they can they can exactly react. Now if our concentrations were not the same then the volumes wouldn't be the same either, right? Because we're talking about molecules. We need the same number of molecules from both sides to react. So for this scenario that happens at 10 mils of titrant added to a 10 mils of our sample. And at that point we would expect it to be perfectly neutral because it's neither acidic nor basic because all of our acid and base has reacted with each other. Now when we're building this graph we don't stop there. We keep adding titrant and what do we expect to happen? Well the pH is going to continue going up so our 11 mil point might be there and then it might be here and then it's going to do this sort of thing and the reason that it's going to keep going up is because we're adding more and more base it has no acid left to react with it so we're going to keep becoming more basic which means a higher pH so now why the strange curve well you might recall that pH is a logarithmic function remember how that a change in one pH is a, ch a tenfold change in the concentration of hydronium ions. So if you imagine starting at a pH of 7 right in the middle, when we add one drop of titrant to that, we are starting initially with, with a neutral solution and we are adding some drops of hydroxide. Well a neutral solution technically has very close to zero hydronium or hydroxide ions in it when you add one drop it's a many many fold change in the concentration of hydronium or hydroxide ions remember to go up by a pH of one to go from seven to eight we need to add ten times the number of hydroxide ions that we had well from zero uh, zero hydroxide ions one drop is way more than ten times the amount or one milliliter if we're thinking about adding one milliliter of titrant but if we, once we're up here, once we have a bunch of hydroxide ions, one drop is no longer a tenfold increase. Let me give it some hypothetical numbers for you. So imagine there was zero hydroxide ions in here. And suppose every milliliter, I'm just going to pick a number, has a million, a million hydroxide ions. So one more drop, we add a million hydroxide ions. The next drop has another million, so now there's two million in there. So the difference between zero and a million is a one million fold increase, and the difference between one million and two million is only doubling. And if we go to the next drop, we'd have three million, and that's not even doubling. So you see what I mean? That um, that's the way a logarithmic function works, that it's interested in increases by a power of 10. So that's just a little explanation of that in case you're interested and you know you can think about how we calculate pH and pOH with the concentration of hydroxide ions and, and the logarithm is involved, right? And if none of that makes any sense then don't sweat it too much for this course but in case you're interested to know why the curve is that shape, that's the reason. So let's look at what kind of information we can get off of a graph like this. First of all we can find the equivalence point. The equivalence point is this region of the graph that has the steepest slope or sometimes it's called an inflection point where the graph switches from moving up to moving down. So this is how we find the equivalence point and for this example our equivalence point has a pH of 7 
and we can also see how much titrant was added when we were at the equivalence point. So we reached the equivalence point by adding 10 milliliters of titrant. Another thing we can do from the graph is choose a suitable indicator. So remember, the key to a titration is to having the visible color change, which is the end point, happen as close as possible to the equivalence point. So we would like an indicator that changes color around a pH of 7. So for example, bromothymol blue changes color from a pH range of 6.0 to 7.6. And at 6.0 it's yellow and at 7.6 it's blue. So that is roughly this pH range here where it would be yellow initially and then it would switch to a blue color as we come past our equivalence point. Or we could have chosen a phenol red, which is yellow at 6.6, .6, but turns red at 8.0. So again, that would be a slightly different range, but it's still going to encapsulate our equivalence point. And since our graph is so steep here, we can be confident that for either one of these indicators, one drop is going to shoot it past that point and turn it the color, right? But let's just imagine we had tried something like methyl orange, which is red at a pH of 3.2 and turns yellow at 4.4. Well, that one is going to start changing color way down here already. And at that point, we're not at our equivalence point. So that one might start changing color when we have only 8 or 9 mils of titrant added. And our pH is, is totally not at our equivalence point yet. So that's why we cannot use methyl orange and we have to choose our indicator based on where the equivalence point happens. And it's all about our equivalence point visibly matching our end point. So remember our equivalence point is theoretical points when all the molecules have reacted, but our end point is when we see the color change from our indicator. So the next thing you might be asking is, well, what's the big deal? Isn't this graph going to look the same for every single acid and base? And wouldn't we always have to use the same indicators? And the answer is no, and that's why these graphs are actually useful. So what, this graph is about a strong acid and a strong base reacting. I'm just going to quickly sketch what a couple of other combinations would look like. So with our strong acid, we started with a very low pH because a strong acid would have a very low pH. And when we added strong base and kept on adding, eventually we end up with basically nothing left but base. And it's a strong base, so a very high pH. Let's suppose we started with a weak acid and we titrated it with a strong base. Well, the titration curve would not start so low. It would start at a bit of a higher pH because our acid was only a weak acid and it would still end very high, close to 14, because we ended with a strong base. And here you can see that our equivalence point is going to have a pH higher than 7. And so we would also need to choose an indicator that changes color in a different pH range. Now let's imagine for a minute that we um, tried something else, and we tried to titrate a base with, with an acid, so the other way around. We put a base in our flask, so let's say we had a weak base and we were titrating that with a strong acid. Well, a weak base starts off with a pH not quite so high as a strong base, and you'll also notice on the weak ones that there's the initial curve is a little more sloped, but but then we, we go through an equivalence point and we end up with a very, very low pH again from our strong acid. And again here, um, it's not drawn perfectly, but our equivalence point would be below 7. So the easiest thing to, to think about them is to put your start and end point on and your equivalence point is about halfway in between. So a weak acid or base does not start as high or low, a strong one is high is very high or very low and put the equivalence point halfway in between so you could also have for example a weak base with a, a weak acid so our equivalent or our start would be not not so high and our end would be not so low it would look something more like that but we would still expect the equivalence point to be around 7 and so these graphs allow us to choose an appropriate indicator based on
what is being titrated. So as you can see, titration curves really help us think about what's going on in a titration so that we can kind of pinpoint what sort of information is useful or important.